Welcome to PwC IFRS Talks, your source of all things IFRS, techno accounting matters, business issues, current standard setting and regulatory updates. I'm your host, Ruth Creedy. In today's episode, I've got two guests with me. I've got Peter Hogarth, who's been with us before. He's our UK accounting technical partner. And I've also got Anna Wallace, a new face to the podcast studio, who, very exciting title, she's Head of Political Relations at PwC, and she's here to talk to us about Brexit. So, hello, the, hello Anna, hello, hello Peter. There. Um, so, uh, excite, well, I don't know if we should say it's exciting, but we are going to do a podcast today on the account of accounting side of Brexit. But before we can probably get into the debits and credits, to you, Anna, we need to talk about generally, could you give us a general update of what's going on? Of course. Um, and of course, massively caveated Definitely. with, <laughs> with the fact that, that this changes uh, not just day by day, hour by hour, but at the moment it feels minute by minute. But where we are at the moment, the Prime Minister is still trying to get her deal through, which she agreed with the EU27 back in November. Uh, it looks very likely that we will end up with a short technical extension to the Article 50 period, probably of a, no more than three months. Uh, and that is to achieve two things. One, so the Prime Minister can try again to get this deal through Parliament, but also so that we can get through all the necessary UK legislation to make, e uh, to make the EU exit uh, a reality. Um, so even the meaningful vote aside, there is a whole legislative programme that's got to go through both the Commons and the House of Lords before we are sort of fully paid up uh, Brexiteers, as it were. So, mm -hmm. so a few hurdles yet. And importantly, in that context, as things currently stand, no deal is still a prospect, not least given it is the current legal default. But even if we pushed out, if we secured a short technical extension, that would obviously still be subject to all those legislative hurdles that I mentioned. So it might just be that no deal takes place later. So for businesses, still a real consideration. Okay, so lots, like you said, so much going on at the moment. And, you know, everyone I'm sure is keeping their eye on news to see what's, what's next in the story. What should companies be thinking about? Like, obviously, they, you hope that they'd be thinking about this for a while now, but what advice would you be giving those companies? Yeah, we've seen a, a, a good level of business engagement throughout the past, what, three years now, in particular from the regulated sectors. But from other big parts of the economy, it's been quite interesting to see businesses flip from saying that it is too soon to do anything on Brexit to suddenly saying that it is too late. <laughs> Now, of course, in that context, a short extension is helpful um, to perhaps wrap up some ends or for some people to start thinking about it. So if people are coming to this um, either quite new or genuinely unsure about what they should first prioritise, there are probably a couple of things that I would say. Firstly, communicate, communicate, communicate to your people primarily. Um, the uh, EU's uh, the UK's exit is quite unsettling, not just for EU nationals, but actually for your general workforce. Are you talking to them about your plans? And of course, helping EU citizens go through any um, settlement processes, if that's what you as a business choose to do. But also your suppliers, your banks, uh, you know, everyone's in this same boat together. What are their plans and how can you learn from them or support or sort of dovetail with them? And of course, the investors and shareholders, which I'm sure Peter will get on to uh, in more detail. Business continuity. Do you have a business continuity plan? Um, is it all uh, dusted off and freshened up in time for the exit date? And around exit date, do you have people travelling? Do you need them to travel or actually can you do those uh, meetings or calls remotely? And again, on that, we've already seen some uh, level of disruption around, for example, the Eurostar station in Paris. And we know of some businesses who have had instructions for people not to travel during uh, around the period of exit date because of the expectation of disruption and delays, etc. So make sure you know where your people are and ask yourselves whether they really need to travel. Okay, so lots of things for people to think about. I must admit, when I was booking a holiday this year, I did think, hmm, should I maybe think about the timing yeah. of when that holiday is? And that's just something totally personal. It's all right if you get stuck on the other side of yeah. the order in, in your True. you know, Costa Brava yeah. or something. <laughs> Not so much fun if you're stuck in Heathrow. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, so uh, back to your, almost like your first point, so much is changing, businesses need to start thinking about it. Where can people go to keep up to date and get more information? 
Yeah, well, one of the things that people might have heard me say before is that uh, the media isn't always the most helpful yeah. resource in this regard because, of course, what we are living in particular at the moment is, the, as I suggested, the minute-by-minute melodrama of the political environment. Actually, for businesses, what we need to focus on is when something materially changes. And yeah. so far, actually, nothing has really changed in spite of all the noise. So, of course, the PwC Brexit website, um, pwc.co.uk forward slash Brexit. We've also got our own series of podcasts which um, listeners can tune into. And I'd, as I said before, go to your banks, if, if not advisors like us. Um, some of the banks have set up support services to specifically help their customers because they recognise that they might be ready for Brexit, but actually they, of course, have a big indirect risk through their um, customers and clients and so many of them are putting on additional support so another helpful resource brilliant that's so helpful so look communicate lots uh, ask for help yeah <laughs> and listen i'm a big fan of podcasts so definitely listen to the podcast series definitely. as well okay now unfortunately this isn't just a podcast about brexit so well fortunately for us we love debits and credits don't we we do we, we love debits and credits songs about it but we won't so um, that is a relief <laughs> Moving to beta, on to the accounting side of it. We're getting close now, I suppose, to some companies that are getting to the end of Q1 as well. What do people need to think about in terms of the interim accounting or what should they be thinking about now? I'm going to continue Anna's theme to some degree of communicate, 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 because yeah. the big message has to be, be clear with your investors, your stakeholders, the readers of your accounts or your interim statement what is the risk or potential impact associated with Brexit? What is the opportunity? It may well be you see an opportunity. I'm going to be apolitical about this. What are you doing in an attempt to manage that as well? Uh, if we look to our regulators in the UK, the FRC has been very clear that it expects companies to be talking about the risks and uncertainties associated with Brexit and how management is dealing with those particular issues. Across Europe, ESMA, uh, European Securities and Markets Authority has given a similar message that it expects companies to talk specifically about the risks and issues faced and what action is being taken. And of course, risks and issues will equally manifest themselves in the accounting. Uh, there are a number of situations where the accounting numbers depend on forecasts or projections, such as where you are considering whether there's an impairment. And of course, now... It isn't just impairment of goodwill and intangible assets that the people listening to this podcast might be used to, but impairment in an expected loss model of receivables uh, or other financial assets may well be something that they've only just tackled for the first time at, at December 2018. And as the degree of uncertainty heightens potentially, then perhaps already it might be time to re, uh, reappraise some of those models that were applied for considering whether receivables might be impaired. So impairment clearly will be yeah. a, an issue. Of course, thinking back to the last time, Ruth, you and I spoke, I believe I was talking about judgments and estimates. And, and, I, and I'm going to talk about I judgments and yeah, estimates. Yeah, yeah. I think that was one Ah, before. that was the one before. <laughs> I'm going to talk about judgments and estimates again. Yeah. Uh, it is a topic that frequently figures quite high in the list of regulator concerns about accounting. And increasingly, we might find that the range of possible outcomes or the sensitivity of estimates companies are making for the purpose of preparing their accounts is, is greater. Uh, and with more uncertainty, with more sensitivity, comes much more focus on the importance of the disclosure. There is a phrase sometimes used in, in accounting standards, what is a reasonably possible outcome? Well, I, I'm not going to even try and profess what may be a reasonable possible outcome as we're recording today, but it's a wide range of potential things that could happen. Yeah. And companies need to realise that when they're deciding on what actually is, is an appropriate range or uh, potential outcomes or potential sensitivity that they're going to disclose. So that's very much around the, the, the sensitivity and uncertainty. It may well be that companies have started to take actions in contemplation of what Brexit might mean for them. We've seen some announcements about uh, restructuring plans, factory closures. Uh, it is to be remembered, of course, that you cannot make a provision for a restructuring until you actually have an obligation based on a past event. Yeah. So if there are merely discussions about or considerations of actions that might be taken, that likely means you're not yet in a position to book a provision at the balance sheet date. If, however, something has been announced, then there are the criteria in IS 37 which need to be walked through to determine is this the time to book a provision. So for those reporting at 31 March, depending on what happens in, in the run-up to that date and what announcements might be made, be worth doing an analysis of actually what plans do we have in place, which ones are we committed to, which ones are we not for the purpose of provisioning. It's interesting as well in the context of a potential technical delay 
to the exit day that Anna was talking about. We've read enough in the media about stockpiling and in certain industries, companies ensuring they have adequate stock levels or those selling having made an increasing volume of sales in the run up to 29th of March in order to ensure that the supply chains are still fluid after exit day. If we don't exit until some later date, and yet those sales, of course, have still happened, it does beg the question, does that increase the risk of sales returns? If Brexit is delayed for a longer period of time, that inventory may not be needed. If you're a purchaser and you've been stockpiling yourself, could it mean that actually you now have excess stock levels? Might you have inventory provisions you need to think about? Now, I suspect this was not an issue we would have even contemplated if we'd had this conversation back in December. But perversely, we're now in a situation of thinking, are some companies prepared too early, over-prepared, and what are the accounting consequences uh, of that? Uh, Just a couple more thoughts on on the accounting side of things. Hedging is not a topic I I like to dabble in too much. No, we don't don't like to dabble in that. But of course, (laughs) one of the items that might be hedged is a highly probable transaction. Companies should be asking themselves, is this transaction still highly probable or not for the purpose of hedge accounting? And also in respect of the payment of dividends in some countries, the UK, but the UK isn't the only one, Dividends may well have been declared, but will not be paid until some time later, which could be after the UK leaves the European Union. It isn't just a case of ensuring that uh, there are sufficient profits from which to pay a dividend at a particular point in time when the dividend is declared. Certainly under UK law, you need to consider whether that dividend may also be paid out of distributable profits on the day of payment, and also consider whether the payment of that dividend would threaten the ability of the entity to pay its debts as and when they fall due into the future. So ensure that if dividends are proposed, that actually it is still appropriate to pay those when the time comes. Okay, so loads of information there. Like, I think what what we're hearing is that there obviously is lots of uncertainty, judgments, estimates, and that has wider implications in accounting, um, specifically like impairment, financial, non-financial. But again, back to the point of you really need to disclose what your con- what risks there are, how you're considering them, and how you're factoring them into your models. So lots in terms of accounting context. One which you haven't picked up there, which I think could be really tricky, is tax as well. So that has broad, you know, real broad implications. What should we be thinking about in terms of tax? Tax is a is a difficult one for a number of reasons, not just because the subject itself is difficult, but because <laughs> well. but because as of today, it might be argued that um, a legal process has commenced. Article fifty has been invoked and and has not yet been um, revoked or, or extended in any way, as as we're recording this. Some might argue, therefore, that the tax consequences should already be foreseeable what will happen uh, if we leave without a deal because if a deal is struck the deal hasn't been struck yet and and that will be a subsequent event we don't hold that view we're of the view that uh, in the event of brexit coming to fruition that will be a change in tax status because the uk will then no longer be an eu country it will be outside the eu so it's a change in the tax status of the uk but nevertheless the time will possibly come in the not too distant future when that will happen and when the UK becomes a third country relative to the EU certain reliefs that have been obtained over the years in respect of transfers of assets Mm -hmm. payments of dividends and so on and so forth interest payments will cease to be available so it's important for those listening to be talking to their tax departments around what exposures there might be and at least be ready in advance understanding what the exposures could be so that when the time comes um whatever tax planning might be needed can be done or the accounting consequences of the of the uh, consequences can be taken into, um, into account properly. Okay, brilliant. So yeah, another tax, another big area which people need to consider. Now, obviously, we're all sitting in the UK um, um, and sometimes you feel like, you know, it's just us in this scenario. But let's think of, you know, overseas companies I presume they can't just ignore Brexit's happening and they need to think about things as well. I, I imagine they wish that they could, but no, they can't. <laughs> I wish I think we all we wish all we could. could. <laughs> um, the, if you think about some of the things we've been debating around supply chain, uh, imports, exports, of course, for everyone's import, there must be an export. Yeah. So if we are concerned about the flow of goods into the UK and the flow of goods out of the UK, well, if, if that is to, for example, France, that is a flow of goods out of France and back into France again. So... The, the cross-border issues, of course, can, uh, to be considered by um, by companies and, and their management either side of the border. Of course, in a group scenario, we might well find businesses that are based in any part of the world could have substantial UK operations. 
Uh, we're already hearing plenty in the UK media about large global conglomerates considering whether they relocate their businesses from the UK. Well, if you are one of those global conglomerates, are you at the point yet where you should be making restriction provisions for what you intend to do with your UK operations or not? That's a question to be to be considered. So it is very much a, a, a global issue that certainly cannot be ignored just because you're outside the UK. Tax as well, of course, those reliefs I talked about may well be also removed if you're a company elsewhere in Europe because yeah. you are no longer dealing with a country that is within the European Union. Yeah, OK, good. So not just a UK issue, everyone really needs to think about it as well. And so Anna gave us some great um, sort of wider reading around Brexit and what you can listen to. If it, have we got anything specific on accounting and Brexit that people can turn to? We do have uh, what we call an in-depth on the accounting implications of Brexit, Yeah. Uh, which might even be also available through the pwc.com Brexit um, part of the site, uh, but is also available anyway through PwC's Inform website. Brilliant. So if people are worried, they're listening to this thinking, I need more information, I think we've given them loads of information they can uh, they can look at. So we've come to the end of our 20 minutes. Thank you so much, Peter and Anna, for joining us. Hopefully this won't be totally out of date when it goes live, <laughs> but it will still be useful. But I think now we've had a really good uh, summary of what's going on and also the accounting. And I think communicate, 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 still in both your lines, that that's the key message we're taking away. So thank you very much for everyone that listening. I've been your host, Ruth Breedy. Happy accounting. The preceding program was brought to you by PricewaterhouseCoopers LLP. This content is for general information purposes and is not a substitute for consultation with professional advisors.